Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you are well. Excellencies, distinguished guests, members of the press, here in the audience, and joining us via live stream from every part of the world, a very warm welcome to Stockholm, Sweden. For the global launch of 2016 Human Rights Development, Human Development Report with the title, Human Development for Everyone. My name is Marika Grisel. I'm a journalist and filmmaker. And for the past 25 years, I've been reporting on development in Africa. But this afternoon, I'm honored to be the host in launching the report that has the potential to influence the life not only of millions of people all over the world, but also lives here in Sweden. We are joined by a number of very honorable guests and speakers. We hear from the Swedish Prime Minister, Stefan Löfven, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for International Development and Climate, Isabella Löfven, the UNDP's Administrator, Miss Helen Clark, and the Director of Human Rights Development Office and the lead author of the report, Mr. Selim Jahan. They are joined by the Professor Emeritus of Economics, University of the Philippines, Professor Sulita Masud. With this lineup, distinguished guests and speakers, we have some stimulating discussions to ahead of us. The insights that are provided can be used not only to shed light on the issues of inequality, but also show us what can be done to reverse it. Please join me in welcoming the Swedish Prime Minister, Stefan Löfven. Thank you so much, uh, Excellencies, Administrator Helen Clark, Mr. Salim Jahan, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I'm honored to be here. And um, a special thanks to Helen Clark and the United Nations Development Program uh, who made this possible, and to Mr. Salim Jahan and his Human Development Report Office and team who once again 
has given us an inspiring report which will continue to push us towards the world we want. I would like to start by quoting Professor Hans Rusling, who sadly passed away last month. He once said, and I quote, the first thing to think about the future is to know about the present, end of quote. Hans Rusling really changed our view of the world today. He did it with statistics showing that the world is actually a better place than most people think. He gave us the most important tool there is for change, hope. The Human Development Report has become an institution. This uni unique report has not only helped to establish a new broad definition of development, but also to evaluate the progress made and make setbacks visible using statistics. This report puts pressure on us as leaders around the world to keep raising our ambitions and following up on areas that need support. Looking back on past human development reports, I'm impressed by some of the amazing improvements that have been achieved. What took Sweden 100 years to achieve? In terms of schooling and, and life expectancy, many of today's developing countries are doing within a generation 25 years. This year's edition of the report is special since it is the 25th. Now, we can actually follow changes in the development landscape now over the course of one generation. From the end of the Cold War, when multilateralism flourished, to a period where globalization integrated people, markets, and work, and to a time when digitalization profoundly changed our way of life. And since then, development has accelerated. In 25 years, life expectancy in China went from 69 years to 76 years. In Colombia, the expected years of schooling went from 9 to 14 years. And in Tunisia, the average income per person doubled. And the big picture is that fewer than 10% of the world's population now live in extreme poverty. Nine out of 10 boys and girls go to school. Billions of people have gained access to clean water. A global middle class is emerging and one in two people have access to a mobile phone. The world's population is better educated, better fed and healthier than ever before. So therefore it is time now to raise the bar and this is what we have done with the new global goals and the 2030 agenda, because the challenges are still huge. We see now deepening wars, conflicts, and terrorist attacks, and in their wake, the worst refugee crisis in modern times. We see growing public skepticism of free trade and globalization, and growing populist and extremist forces. And last year, we also saw the warmest on record. Climate change is catching up with us. And even though we are seeing less extreme poverty around the world, inequality is increasing. If you fill a bus, I used to say, actually, that if you fill a bus, now you can say, if you fill a minibus, if you fill a minibus with the richest people in the world, they own as much as the poorest half of 3.5 billion people. That's absurd. It is totally unacceptable. Now, I welcome the theme of this year's report, Human Development for Everyone. It highlights the need for equality. Leaving no one behind needs to become the way 
we operate as a global community. There is a moral dimension, of course, but there is also an economic one, because equality is winning new ground now among economists. Let me quote one of those economists, the IMF's managing director, Christine Lagarde. She says, and I quote, you do not have to be an altruist to support policies that lift the incomes of the poor and the middle class. Everybody will benefit from these policies because they are essential to generate higher, more inclusive, and more sustainable growth." End of quote. Simply put, equal societies perform better. We must address the problems in the global labor market, build social cohesion, and shape a form of globalization that represses no one but benefits everyone. This is also the driving force behind the Global Deal Initiative. It encourages cooperation between employers, employees, and governments to bring about decent work, increase productivity, and enhance economic stability and shared prosperity. It is time to make globalization work for everyone. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone, because globalization must work for both women and men. One of Sweden's strongest forces for development is the fact that both men and women work. We have one of the highest employment rates in the world. And it's well known that women's participation in the economy has positive effects on just about everything on growth, on health, on education, on food security. And the general welfare system is key for women's liberalization. But still, women in Sweden are also paid less. They do more of the unpaid work at home. So the fight for gender equality must go on in Sweden and in the rest of the world. The gender inequality index that was introduced in 2010 helps us to keep track of one of the chief factors blocking human development. Women and men are equal. Women and men should be treated equally. Women and men should have equal opportunities. Nothing else will do. Finally, I would take this opportunity to thank you, Helen, for having done a remarkable job. You have served with admirable dedication and unwavering resolve. Under your leadership, UNDP has empowered people to lift themselves out of poverty and create sustainable livelihoods in times of severe financial crisis. You have compelled the UN development system to increase coherence and brought home the necessity of the UN acting in unison on the delivery of the 2030 agenda. And for Sweden, for me personally, it has been a privilege to be your partner. Uh, I'm now eager to listen to you addressing the opportunities and the challenges that lie ahead armed with the knowledge, facts, and statistics in this year's Human Development Report. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Stefan Löfven, Prime Minister of Sweden. The Human Development Report is indeed the flagship of the United Nations Development Programme. Every year, this report focuses on an important theme and applies the human development lens onto that topic. I now give the floor to the UNDP administrator, Ms. Helen Clark, to present the main findings in this year's Human Development Report, Human Development for Everyone. Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, my dear colleague, the former Deputy Secretary General, Jan Eliasson, uh, members of Parliament, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 
And we are so delighted at UNDP uh, that the Prime Minister of Sweden, the Deputy Prime Minister of Sweden, have agreed to be with us at this launch of the latest Human Development Report, Human Development for All. Sweden is a very appropriate host for the launch of such a report, as it has long championed human development at home and abroad. The results of its commitment and investments are reflected in its own very high ranking on the Human Development Index. And as well, Sweden has been such a generous contributor for so long to lifting human development around the world through its support for international development cooperation. A quick word on the context of these reports. As the Prime Minister said, it's the 25th report. And when they began in 1990, they began with a simple yet powerful idea that people are the real wealth of a nation. The human development concept defines development in terms of how to enlarge people's choices and capabilities to live lives that they value. It puts people at the very center of development, both as the drivers of development and the beneficiaries of it. And the Human Development Index, which accompanies each of the global reports, has indicators across income, education, and health status in order to give a more balanced picture of progress than just measuring by GDP per capita alone could. As the Prime Minister said, a lot of progress has been made uh, since the first of these reports was released. But the progress hasn't reached everybody. And what this report focuses on is who has been left behind uh, as others have progressed and what would you need to do to overcome that exclusion. Ensuring that development progress is broadly shared is not just the right thing to do, it is essential to building the foundations for the peaceful, just and inclusive societies which are envisaged in the new global agenda, Agenda 2030. So let me come to three main messages from the report. Firstly, average figures of progress do disguise rather a lot. They disguise the inequalities. Of course, on average, the Human Development Index has been registering substantial progress in every region since 1990. But when you look underneath the averages, it is clear that a significant number of lives have scarcely been touched by that movement. That one third of the world's population continues to live in low human development status, and hundreds of millions of those people live in countries classed as having medium, high, or even very high development for human development. In almost every country, we find really the same groups tend to be more disadvantaged than others. Those groups include very large groupings, like half the population, which are women and girls, rural populations, people with disabilities, ethnic and faith minorities, indigenous peoples, migrants and refugees, older people, and the LGBTI communities. And the disadvantages they face may be multidimensional, that those born into disadvantage are more likely to suffer disadvantage themselves throughout the life cycle. Those who have been systematically excluded often face deep and persistent barriers embedded in laws and local norms, which result in unequal access to economic resources and social participation and rights. And they become then much more vulnerable to the impacts of shocks and crises. Gender inequality and the lack of women's empowerment remain significant challenges to global progress on human development across all regions. Women tend to be poorer, even in Sweden and even in my own country of New Zealand, tend to earn less, have fewer opportunities to participate in civic life than do men. There are countries still where a husband's permission is required for a woman to work. In around 100 countries, women are denied access to certain jobs just because they are women. Second major message, Ensuring human development for everyone will require us to have much better data and analysis to inform policy and action. National statistical systems need to collect disaggregated data across a wider range of the socioeconomic indicators. 
Even gender disaggregated data is in short supply in many countries. New sources of data, like big data, need to be tapped too to expand our knowledge of where development challenges lie. And we need both quantitative and qualitative data. For example, it's encouraging to know that girls' enrolment in primary education has increased in most countries, but discouraging to learn that in half of 53 developing countries with the relevant data, the majority of adult women who completed four to six years of primary schooling are illiterate. That speaks to lack of quality in education. The report also recommends taking a broader view of development, which recognizes both the traditional, more tangible aspects, like better health and education, and the importance of the more intangible aspects, the voice and empowerment, for example, which are both objectives of human development and a very powerful means by which communities can achieve it, including by ensuring that all groups are represented at the table when the national priorities are being set. Third main message, global institutional reforms, which produce a fairer multilateral system are important if development is to reach everyone. And the report argues that these reforms should support better regulation of global markets, governance of multilateral institutions, and strengthening global civil society. And that the reforms should address key challenges like the generation of global public goods. So the reports call for action. It does have a set of national policy recommendations to complement its proposals around the reform of global institutions. On the national level, these would include ensuring that policies and programs which promote human development are designed for and can reach everyone, including those who to this time have been left behind. Making development more inclusive is critical. The Global Deal, which the Prime Minister of Sweden has championed, is cited in the report as a good example of promoting inclusive development. And that deal would put decent work at the center of macroeconomic policy. It needs support from national governments, employers, unions, and broader civil society. The report recommends that recognizing the most disadvantaged will need extra support to overcome discrimination. That is important if human development for everyone is to be realized. It says that human development progress will need to be made much more resilient. We see how a range of shocks, from natural disasters and epidemics to economic crises and conflicts, will reverse hard-won development gains. And they do hit the vulnerable and the marginalized the hardest. So by building resilience into development pathways, including through stronger social protection systems and effective risk management and disaster risk reduction, countries can mitigate against shocks and development setbacks. Let me say in conclusion that the report is optimistic. Human development for everyone is not a dream. It is attainable. This country, Sweden, has long inspired me with its commitment to human development. Now the 2030 Agenda provides that commitment at the global level to leave nobody behind in development. And the report we are launching today shows how the human development approach supports achieving the broader 2030 Agenda and the SDGs, and thereby helps to build a more peaceful and equitable world. Thank you. Please stay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Clark. Um, today we're not only launching this report, aren't you? The UNDP is also launching an app. Yes. Could you tell us something more about this app that everybody can access via the um, yes. app store? Your cell phone. Yes, your cell phone, <laughs> exactly. I have it on my cell phone. Yes. <laughs> Already. Can you show us? Can you tell us uh, about it? So, uh, Actually, it's quite exciting because it provides in one place everything you ever wanted to know 
about any of the 700 human development reports that have been produced in the last 27 years. Uh, when you go into this app on the phone, you can pull up the you know, 1995 human development report on Bangladesh or, or wherever. It is all there on one portal. This is the wonder of, of modern technology. So all those global, regional, sub-regional and national human development reports from more than 130 countries can be accessed through the uh, apps. And of course, uh, the report we're launching today is there as well. So it's an incredible body of knowledge and I think it will be of great interest to people researching in the human development area. And for all you in the audience here, you can uh, read more about and access this outside when you exit. And for those who are watching it live, you can go to App Store. And now we will also see an animation, a film about the report. Thank you. During the past quarter of a century, there have been impressive improvements for the lives of billions across the planet and progress in human development and the Human Development Index. Between 1990 and 2015, the number of countries classified as having low human development fell from 63 to 41, as the number of people in low human development countries was reduced from 3.2 billion to 1.2 billion. But the progress has not enriched every human life. Certain groups are systematically excluded by a combination of economic, social, political, and cultural barriers. For example, in 18 countries, women are required to have their husband's approval to get a job. And in 32 countries, women face different procedures to obtain a passport than men. As new development challenges are emerging, these people are in danger of being forgotten. Making human development work for everyone requires removing deep-rooted barriers and strengthening analysis and approaches to measurements. We need to examine more closely not just what has been achieved, by whom, how, and to what effect, but also who has been excluded and why. This requires disaggregation of data for characteristics such as place, gender, and ethnicity. Focus on quality of achievements, not only on the quantity, and inclusion of emerging data resources, including big data to complement the traditional statistical methods. Global and national policy options exist, and if implemented, they would contribute to achieving the goal. The report proposes a detailed four-pronged national policy approach, reorienting universal human development policies, adopting specific measures for those with special needs, implement strategies to make human development resilient, empowering those left out, providing voice and autonomy. This calls for reforms in global institutions, which should encompass regulation of global markets, governance of multilateral institutions, and strengthening of global civil society. Human development for everyone is attainable, and Human Development Report 2016 special contributors share this vision. For more information on human development and to explore human development reports, index, and data, please visit our website at hdr.undp.org.
www.ghanaspeaks.org. Yes, thank you very much. And before we go deeper into the report, I would like to invite uh, Deputy Prime Minister Isabella Levin and the former Minister Solita Monsud onto stage. Please have a seat. So I would like to start with you, Isabella Levine. You are the Deputy Prime Minister and you are responsible for International Development Corporation as well as climate. Uh, what synergies do you see between these two different portfolios in terms of contributing to human development? Well, um, thank you for the question. It's great to be here and congratulations to an excellent report. Um, well, of course, there are extremely clear linkages between the fight against climate change and our quest, our, our common quest for human development. Because if we don't succeed in, uh, well, living up to the commitments in Paris and fighting climate change and also adapting our ways of life and for those that are most, most vulnerable for climate change, we will not uh, be able to uh, secure human, safe human development for everyone and certainly not achieve the sustainable development goals of the Agenda 2030 that we agreed upon in, uh, in 2015, the same year that we also agreed on the Paris uh, Agreement. Because, of course, uh, climate change is affecting us all here in Sweden. We see the the, the snowing at uh, the the cold season being becoming shorter and shorter for each year. But it's those that are most vulnerable today that are affected most by climate change. And for some countries and some people, it's very much an existential threat uh, to their entire countries, such as uh, Kiribati, a small Pacific island state that I visited last year, that are really being threatened by sea level rise, and they're, they're actually planning uh, for uh, uh, evacuating the, the entire nation of Kiribati, buying up land on Fiji and encouraging their young people to actually emigrate uh, to start a new future somewhere else. So this is really a, a huge obstacle uh, for, for human development, for democracy, for human rights, for all these things that we need in order to, to develop in a positive way. So we, we can't exclude or just think about human development in like a a people-centered way, uh, we need to take into account uh, the whole uh, environment that we live in. And that's mm -hmm. the lesson we've learned uh, during all these years of abuse of our planet while uh, developing uh, uh, as, as people and are contributing to, to um, uh, well-being as well. The issue of development is indeed a complex issue. You also represent a feminist government. government. What are the key policies and priorities to give women and girls a better life in this context? Well, we cannot uh, achieve 100% success with only 50% of the people. So we need uh, to engage uh, everyone and unleash the potential that it's, it's kind of something that we say very often, but it's really true that if we unleash the potential of 50% of the world's population, we will have so much bigger chance of success. And uh, our country, Sweden, and I think my prime minister also mentioned that, we have uh, really the experience of uh, working very systematically, and it's been women, by the way, that have been fighting for their own rights, uh, but working very systematically with uh, ensuring that women have the same possibility as men. And while we've done that, we've also made a, a, a very uh, fast uh, 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 travel towards uh, uh, economic sustainability. But I think also the theme uh, of this report touches upon the issue of, of universality and 
for me, that means also uh, a general access to social services and welfare. And we've achieved uh, gender equality through reforms such as, of course, access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. That is something that is extremely important to stress today because we see forces that are really working <laughs> against these rights. We're going in the totally wrong direction and Sweden is really uh, very forcefully pushing uh, for, for sexual and reproductive health and rights being at the center of uh, our development cooperation. Uh, also childcare, parental leave, maternity leave, uh, those are reforms that have made it possible for women to participate in society and to development and that's really, really important and that's also things that we are pushing for and using in our development cooperation. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister Isabella Levin. Uh, I'm now honoured to ask the main author of the report, uh, Mr. Salim Yahan, to give more details about the report to all of us. Would you like to take the stage, please? Yes. Mm. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me start with a very simple statement. Every human being counts, and every human life is equally valuable. That principle of universalism is at the core of the human development approach and has been the driving force behind the 2016 Human Development Report. Upholding that principle and resonating the 2030 development agenda, the 2016 Human Development Report asserts that in the human development journey, no one should be left behind. Human development is not for the few, not even for the most, but for everyone. Building on the messages so eloquently presented by the administrator, let me share with you five basic findings of the 2016 Human Development Report. First, along with progress, significant deprivations still persist. On the progress side, since 1990, every year, 136,000 people have escaped extreme poverty. And more than 2 billion people have been lifted out of low human development. Child mortality has been halved, and 2.6 billion people now have access to safe water. On the other side of the balance sheet, there are deprivations which are lingering, like poverty. Some are deepening, like inequalities. Some are emerging, like climate change. One in every three people still live in low human development, and 1.5 billion people still face multidimensional poverty. Every minute, 11 children under five are dying. Every hour, we are losing 35 mothers while giving birth to a child. Inequalities have become the defining issue of our time. Eight billionaires own wealth equivalent to the wealth of the bottom 50% of humanity. In other words, each billionaire is worth 462 million people. Air pollution kills 6 million people every year, and 38 million lives are lost due to non-communicable diseases. If we do not address the issue of climate change today, there will be 100 million additional people in extreme poverty by 2030. Second finding, in every society, there are specific groups which face systemic deprivation and discrimination. 
These groups, among others, are women and girls, indigenous peoples, ethnic minorities, persons with disabilities, migrants and refugees, and so on. And we have to address these issues very deeply. 350 million indigenous peoples represent only 5% of global population, but account for 15% of global poverty. 65 million people are forcibly displaced from homes, and that number is larger than the population of France. So therefore, it is imperative that we look at these issues very, very carefully. Let me just take one second to focus more on issues that women and girls face. Globally, the female labor force participation rate is only 49%, as opposed to 76% for men. Women work in agriculture a lot, but they own only 9% of land. Every year, 15 million girls under 18 are getting married. It means one child bride every two seconds. And therefore, women face discrimination and deprivations as a life cycle phenomena. And we have to be mindful of those gender gaps. East Asia, if the present trend continues, will take 111 years to close just the economic gender gap. And the Arab states, 356 years. We do not have that time. Third, mapping of deprivations is critical, but it is not enough. Human development for everyone also requires that we look at some of the analytical issues as well as the assessment perspectives. For example, it's good to talk about individual capabilities, but collective capabilities are also important because people who are marginalized cannot go far only through individual effort. They would need collective support. Similarly, human development often talks about well-being freedom, but the agency freedom is also important because voice and autonomy are needed most by the disadvantaged people because they want to influence things that shape their lives. In terms of assessment perspectives, let me just raise three issues. One, we need a disaggregated framework to have a better sense of how society is faring. For too long, we have been held hostages to the tyranny of the averages. And let us end that right now. Second, the quality of human development is as important as its quantity. Yes, more children are enrolled and are attending school. But one vital question is, what are they learning? And third, the human development assessment should also take advantage of new forms of data, big data, real-time data, open data, and so on. Fourth, human development for everyone would need a four-pronged national policy matrix. First, we need universal policies in terms of inclusive growth, in terms of investing in women and girls, financial inclusion, making expenditures more human priority friendly. Second, we have to have specific measures for those who are in special needs. For example, affirmative actions, quota, if and when necessary. Third, human development will neither be sustained nor be sustainable if it is not resilient. So therefore, we have to take climate change seriously, and we have to have instruments to deal with global epidemics. We have to address the issues of conflict. Fourth, people have to be empowered in terms of being protected, their 
human rights, in terms of ensuring accountability and transparency in the system in which they live. Finally, further advances are possible. Changes are taking place. Transformations are not dreams. People are raising their voices. There are more awareness about environmental sustainability. Human ingenuity and creativity are opening new doors. But most importantly, slowly but steadily, there are consensus on various global issues. Just look at the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. What was once unthinkable is now unstoppable. In the ultimate analysis, human development for everyone is not a dream, it is a reality. We can build on what we have achieved. We can explore new possibilities. We can attain what once seemed unattainable. Hopes are within our reach to realize. So for the next 14 years, let us start a journey from deprivations to prosperity, from challenges to opportunities, from despair to hope. And in that journey, let us first reach out to those who are farthest behind. Because if we do that, then we shall see that we shall end up at the end of the road all together. And when we look back, we shall find that nobody has been left behind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salim Yahan. Uh, interesting and deeply inspiring as well. It is possible. It is possible. Uh, we are now honored to listen to Professor Emeritus Solita Mansud from University of the Philippines to give us some insights and comments regarding this report. And we have this window of opportunity until just after four o'clock, so <laughs> that's my, the limit of, of our time. Well, uh, let me, good, good afternoon to you all. Let me start by saying I'm coming from, I'm coming from a developing country perspective and I'd like to put just a little bit of reality. I mean, I don't want to destroy the dream reality, but I do want to bring up certain issues that are very, that we find, at least in my country, very difficult to achieve. To uh, The Human Development Report, the first Human Development Report in 1990, already talked about the need for disaggregation, about the need for data, et cetera, this need for sustainable development. You have to read the report to see how far-reaching that report was. And we from the developing countries thought that that human, first human development report and the succeeding human development reports were great help to us because gave intellectual leadership, and it communicated in a way that was very easy to understand. In other words, the readers were non-government organizations and government organizations and government officials, because you all know that government officials are not necessarily the most um, uh, intellectual of people, <laughs> and non-government organizations like so. Well, anyway, what the Human Development Report has been doing for us, it has been giving us intellectual leadership from above, and it has given us push from below because it has given us ways of doing things. I mean, it really details what can be done specifically. And so we are very grateful for the Human Development Report. It's been 20, 25 years since 1990. And um, with regard to disparity, with, with regard to data, I'd like to, I mean, with regard to the progress, you say 
X million, X number of people out of poverty and Y million of people out of this and out of that. But where are these people? I think a lot of, a lot of the people are concentrated in only one or two countries, very few. Well, that's, that's an exaggeration. But I did look at the trends in human development in this is from 1990 to 2014, there was a report. I, it's, it was in the 2015 report. And, you know, in 1990, we started, all right? Human Development Report, 2015. In 2000 comes this huge global, uh, ex well, enthusiasm signed by 189 or 179 countries. So one would expect that as a result of this uh, uh, acknowledgement of the, the desire for human, for better conditions for all, that the Human Development Index rate of growth would have been, would have increased even just a little. Don't you think? 1990 to 2000, there was a human development uh, th that trend and then 2000 to 2015, I would have expected as an ordinary person that the, the human development rate of growth would have increased because of the uh, positive support of 189 countries. Well, the, uh, the data doesn't show it. For example, in, for the very high human development, only six out of 49 countries increased their rate of human development growth. For the high, only 13 out of 38, where there were data, increased their rate of human development growth. For the low, only 28, I mean, for the low, 29 out of 44 countries, and for the, I mean, for that, that's for the medium, and for the low, 18 out of 44 countries. So what happened to the, the, to the other countries? In other words, the majority of the countries who signed with such great enthusiasm the Millennium Development Com Compact uh, actually reduced their efforts as shown by the Human Development Index. That is the reality. And the Human Development Index has three major indicators, three or four major indicators, and it is very difficult already to get th that kind of data. But the Human Development Index was based out of what data was available there. And Mabub ul-Haq in, in 1990 said, we need all this disaggregated data. Nothing, I mean, very little has been done. But with the sustainable, I mean, with the Millennium Development Goals, what has happened is that they needed even more data. We had three indicators, the Sustainable Development indica uh, the Goals has uh, eight goals and, and uh, 21 targets and 69 in indicators. Now we have the sustainable. Please look at it from the developing country point of view. Now the Sustainable Development Goals asks for 17 targets, and I don't know how many, but 117 goals and 179 targets. How do you think we're going to get this kind of, kind of data? I mean, how, how do you think we will have the resources to get this kind of disaggregated data? So it is a dream. It is not a dream, you say, Ms. Clark and, and Salim. It's not a dream, it will be a reality in 2030. I, I don't think so, not from our point of view. My country, the Philippines, we have the, one of the best, if not the best statistical systems in Asia. And yet for, night, for the sustainable development goals, we will not be able to get to generate the kind of statistics that are required. So I'm, I, I, 
I'm, push, I'm pulling for the Human Development Report to take a more important role, not just a role in, in helping the Sustainable Development Goals and in helping the Millennium Development Goals. I think the Millennium, the Human Development Report, from the point of view of a developing country, is one of the best. And in fact, for the, fu for the future, looking ahead, you don't want to look at the look at the past, you want to look at the future. Did you know, the, uh, you know why the window in a car, the front window is very large and the rear view mirror is very small? Because the past is not, is important, but it's not as important as the future. And that's what we want to do. We want to look at the future. What do we, what do we need? Well, coming over here, it occurred to me some of our goals in our development plan call for that the way of doing business, that the competitiveness of the Philippines has to be improved, has to increase the, from the, you know, we have to go up in rank to the top third. Well, we haven't done that. We are very, very strong on human development index and hum, human development, and we haven't done that for to measure human development. So I think we should instead pursue the path of saying human development indicators for this country or your country or, my, or, or, or other countries in the developing world. They should say in the next six years, we have a six year term for the president. The next Professor? six years, our human development index must increase by so much or our rank must increase by so much. Professor, I have That's to interrupt the best thing there because to you have posed some sorry, interesting sorry. questions. Thank you so Thank much, you. Professor <laughs> Salida Masood. Thank you. So we're getting some interesting aspects here from you. We need to look more at how we collect data. This is one of the issues. We can post that question straight to you, uh, Mr. Salim. Looking back towards, uh, uh, you have seen, you have been involved in many human development reports over the years. If you're now looking both back and forward, how do you see that you're going to tackle the human development report in the future? Uh, Briefly, now we are looking at our time here. <laughs> uh, looking back and looking forward, since I'm one of the usual suspects, yes. um, I think three points I would like to make. One is that world has changed, so therefore, the relevance of human development in the current world is even more than it was 25 years ago. And we have to take that into account in the report. Second, we are also talking about no one left behind. Therefore, the human development paradigm and the human development concept, both in terms of um, intellectual exercise, in terms of the data gathering, will have to address that particular issue as we move forward. And finally, as Salita has uh, put forward, I think evidence is something which is the strongest weapon to bring policies, to bring analysis to the forefront. So we'll continue to work on gathering more data, in gathering disaggregated data, working with national statistical offices and international organizations to bring data to the forefront, because in the ultimate analysis, data are power. Thank you, Mr. Salim Jahan, the main author of this year's Human Development Report. Thank you so much. Isabella Levin, Deputy Prime Minister of Sweden, uh, as one of the UNDP's largest donors, how do you see uh, the human development concept moving on? Um, I think it, it, it has a, a, a very important role to play. Uh, but also, I think the Agenda 2030, I happen to be one of the fans of, of Agenda 2030, uh, is equally uh, important. Because as Hel the administrator said in the beginning here now, so we can see some progress on life, life uh, expectancy, on uh, gross national income per capita, and uh, even years in school, but that hides the inequalities that would be below those data. 
And um, Sweden, right now, we're, we're going to present actually for the first time in our uh, uh, spring budget uh, alternative indicators to gross national income. And I think we need really data on that are on, on gender, based on gender, we need data on um, environmental progress and, and uh, of course, the inequalities that we see now in the world that are actually increasing are, are contributing to polarization and a tension in the world that will actually make it impossible for sustainable development for the entire world. Uh, we see an increase in wars and conflict. We see also a polarization in our own in our own country, in Sweden, it, uh, the, this welfare state that some look at as some kind of uh, almost uh, uh, perfect state, but we have also these tensions within our own country. And this is, I think, uh, something we need to address more and more. So more data, more uh, reliable data. We need also to support the developing countries in having, providing uh, uh, the resources to collect uh, data uh, that can also serve uh, policy de decision making on, on addressing these enormous challenges that we have to really have a sustainable development. Thank you, Isabella Levine. Uh, finally, Ms. Helen Clark. Uh, the report argues for a number of global um, reforms regarding uh, governance, global governance. How do you see uh, the priorities in this area? Which is the top priorities? I get the easy question. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> towards the end. <laughs> but uh, the, the very short answer, I think, is that global governance is not seen as sufficiently inclusive and representative at this time. Uh, you have across key organs like the Security Council, the IMF, the, w, uh, the World Bank, a distinct imbalance of representation. And of course representation matters because it's about voice and it's about the decisions that are made. Uh, had there been different structures in the international financial uh, uh, decision making, for example, would we have seen those very rough years of structural adjustment, which probably put back continents like Africa uh, quite some time because they stood in the way of the developmental state that could push things uh, ahead. I think we also see imbalances now between small and large. So a great deal of the drive for the kinds of decisions that are made is coming from the G20. Sweden and New Zealand aren't in the G20, and nor are most countries, so there is that, that imbalance as well. And then I think in the modern world, you can't just rest uh, on the member states calling all the shots in, in the institutions. The UN Charter starts with the words, we the peoples, but actually it's been we the member states for all these years, and we have to find better ways of involving the civil society and the wider range of actors, they expect voice too. So I think if you, if you change representation and power structures, you start to change agendas, and that will be more helpful for lifting human development uh, across the board. Mm, thank you so much, Ms. Helen Clark. And that is drawing us to the close. It's been very interesting, enormous challenges, but also positive insights. Almost everybody here, I presume everybody in the room and many of the audience are having these issues at their very heart and will go out and work, use the report, criticize it, spread it, use the app, of course, and you can download it, as we've been told before during this hour of our discussions from App Store, and you can get more information when you walk out through the doors here. Uh, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, for those here in the audience, there will be refreshments from the press. There will be a press conference on the floor above. And uh, let us strive for inclusion for everybody. That is our future. Leave no one behind. And thank you everyone to be, that have been with us this last hour.